How many of you have heard of ESP8266? Everyone in the room? More, almost everyone in the room. So I'm from the company that makes that. And uh, uh, we also do something known as the ESP32, which is the bigger brother to ESP8266. And my talk today is going to be uh, a little different from what we've been uh, hearing so far because I'm going to be showing a lot more code and demoing on stage. Uh, but more importantly, uh, it's going to be about what happens after your prototype phase is done, right? Because uh, when you say ESP8266, the first thing that comes to your mind is the maker community, the DIY community, the hacker community, right? And uh, this particular presentation is for what happens after that, right? So, uh, so this is a little bit about test pressure. So I realized this, so this was not in my slide deck. So this is a standard uh, about the company slide deck. I thought everyone would know Espresso system, but everyone knows ESP8266, right? A lot of people have like, uh, they asked me what is Espresso system, but they knew about ESP8266. So that was funny, but um, yeah, so we are a 10 year old company uh, and we have been in the chip making business uh, for that long. And 8266 is our most popular one. Uh, but the 32 one is the latest flagship one. And what we've added is Bluetooth, uh, both Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy uh, to that chip. Uh, yeah, uh, that number is actually a little old. Uh, we are now at a solid 260 employees all over the world. I'm from the India office here. Uh, and that's it, that's about the company. Uh, so Espresso loves open source, everything that we've been doing, we have been releasing to the public for the last four or five years, uh, starting with the ESP8266, which became a very popular chip uh, courtesy of Hackaday and the hacker community. Uh, and yeah, I mean, after that, most of the people that have joined Espresso have joined Espresso because they were uh, working on tools to do things with uh, ESP8266 or ESP32. And then Espresso was like, you know what, just join the company and work from there. So that's a very nice culture because, uh, you know, we have people working at Espresso from all over the world. One of my colleagues works from Australia, another works from Vietnam. And all of those people were initially contributors and then they were employees. So that's a very great culture that we have at Espresso. Uh, so these are our two most popular projects, the ESP IDF, which is for the SDK for ESP32, and the ESP RTOS SDK, which is for uh, the RTOS team. Uh, so today what we're going to be talking about is how to take these and add some software components on top of that and then go to production. Uh, okay, so about me, uh, I have some production experience uh, myself. So I was part of the team that uh, did a crowdfunding project based out of Pune, India. Uh, this is back in 2014. And uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't exactly an internet of connected things because it was based on uh, Bluetooth Low Energy but it had a lot of production related things because we had to mass manufacture uh, 1000 units. So yeah, I learned a lot about that there. So I'm going to be talking a bit about that. Uh, there's one more uh, product that I did after that in 2017, uh, 2016, 2017, which was a Wi-Fi development board. It was not using the ESP32 uh, because that had just been launched. It was using something known as the Marvel 88 MW300. So I have some experience with production. So I'm going to be sharing a bit about that today. So uh, how many of you were there for the first session where you know Mitch and Bunny and everyone were talking about? Yeah, so production is, is a pain, right? Uh, and as Mitch rightly said, right, everyone thinks, yeah, I will just go to production after that. And that's, that's like one line that's the end of them all, right? Uh, because it's a very different experience from what we are used to, right? Uh, so I'm not very well eloquent kind of a person, but uh, there's a hardware hacker called Volport who went on a rant one day on Twitter, right? And he was like, you know why your Kickstarters failed? And then he did like 30 tweets after that. So I just took those tweets and I put it in a table in an Excel sheet. And I'm, I'm going to present that as part of this. <laughs> <laughs> because honestly, yeah, and that, that's the tweet that started it all, right? So Bolpot was like, you know why our Kickstarters are failing? This, right? it was a beautiful tweet and everyone from the hacker community was like, this is amazing stuff. So uh, let's start. So uh, the first thing is coding, 
right? So I don't want to call maker coding sloppy because that's rude. But Boltport said it, so I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just let, let's just be, leave it at that. But yeah, uh, and this is really important, right? Because uh, inefficient coding means you'll probably require a two megabyte flash. But if you're doing things efficiently, you are freeing your mallocs. That means you'll probably get done in one megabyte, right? And when I'm prototyping, I don't care about my freeze. I just care about my mallocs and allocs, right? So uh, that's a C joke. Given the number of laughs I got, mostly there are Python programmers in the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or JavaScript, worse. Anyways, not to pick sides. Uh, yeah, so essentially when you're building products, uh, when you're prototyping, your issues are issues that you can solve on Stack Overflow. But uh, when you're talking about stuff like, uh, you know, how do I do customs? How do I do certification? You're going to have to hire consultants, which costs money and which you don't typically force. The next thing is sourcing, right? Because you can order five components of Airflow, you can order 10 components of Spark Fun, and you will be well on your way. You could do that with PCDs too, because you know, OSH, OSH Park is doing great. There are a bunch of other services, right? But when you are doing a thousand units, you can't do that because you have to talk to the distributor and you have to figure out some deal. That guy is going to send you some mail, you are going to reply to it, it's going to be a long thread, then you have to wire him money, not your typical credit card experience. A bunch of different shitty things are going to happen there. And after that, you're going to get your components. And all of this has to be in time before you go to production, even a single component missing means that your production can't happen on that day and everything has to be by spec. So that's a very different experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is kind of overlapping with what I just said, right? Free next day delivery, add a food will FedEx it to you or USPS to you, but you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. testing is again something, uh, so uh, Bunny uh, isn't here actually, but Bunny and Jobs have been, uh, Jobs I think mostly, has been working on a project called Exclave, which is great. Right, uh, Zobs has a talk, I think, uh, I'm not sure. I think it was from 35C3. Yeah, it was from 36C3 or something like that, where they are building a great uh, framework for testing. And that's because as uh, makers, we don't test our prototype so much, but when you go to production, you have to catch each and every bug, otherwise you're going to have returns and that's going to be very expensive. Again, when you're prototyping, what's support? Uh, yeah, you've never heard of that, but uh, you're going to have angry customers writing very shitty things about you on Amazon if you don't give them the right kind of support, right? And that's what going to production means. No. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I think I went to right side. But anyway, circuit design, uh, you look at different components, you look at some open source schematics, you just put stuff together. But when you're going to production, you have to think about a lot of things because your things like certifications are going to matter a lot. Some components are not going to be as easy as available as others. Some are going to be easily available, but going to be expensive. So you're going to look for Chinese counterparts right, which are cheaper, and in that case, it's going to move things around. So again, that's something that you have to do. Again, the next part is something uh, which I kind of disagree with with Boltport here because KiCad is doing great, right? KiCad is doing amazing. And that's really for the community, man. Like, kudos to the community because everyone just rallied behind that. It's Enclosure, again, this is something that people usually 3D print. Uh, people would see and see laser cut, everything, it works great. Early developers are happy with it, early adopters are happy with it. The minute you start thinking big, the minute you start thinking about more than 500, 1000 units, those numbers don't add up. Then you have to do injection holding and that's a very different thing. Jobs has a good video, I think Chinmay recommended that. So, again, shipping. So this is something that uh, uh, I made a mistake on when we were doing the crowdfunding campaign that I talked about earlier. We should have explored a lot more uh, options, but by the time that we shipped, we were quite late. So we had to go with FedEx, which was exorbitant, right? And uh, you don't realize that unless you're doing huge volumes, it doesn't make sense to do FedEx. Uh, yeah, again, <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is, yeah, this is uh, one of those, uh, what syndrome is that? Uh, imposter syndrome things. 
that kind of happens when you're going to production. Yeah, again, this is something that uh, we did not foresee. When you have boxes, you need to hold them, keep them, and they stack up. Man. They stack up like crazy. And you you don't really have that kind of real estate if you're doing this as a small company. Compliance is, again, something because this can incur heavy legal fees, right? Everything from the uh, barcode that you put on your uh, device, uh, on the packaging, right, to the certifications in case you are a wireless uh, device, right? Uh, it's all crazy. Plus, you've got power certifications for some countries. And yeah, you have to, you can't control where your customers are from. If you start doing that, that gets bad press. So again, you have to think about those things. Yeah, and <laughs> this also happened with me. <laughs> so yeah, uh, pricing is a pain. Uh, typically, people suggest that, you know, if your bomb cost is $5, you should be selling it for at least 12 and a half. That's 2.5. But anyways, that is something that we don't figure out. Yeah, and this is like the final thought, right? Like before you go to production, you're like, well, how hard could this be, man? And that's how you end up. Uh, yeah, again, this is also what, uh, something that happens. Uh, so yeah, this is the last point. So again, this is something that happens with typically all Kickstarter projects, right? I, I, I don't know a single project that has delivered on time. Uh, I think Bunny's book delivered on time. If I, if I, yeah. Yeah, it was a crowd supply. It was a crowd supply. Yeah, but we were on crowd supply and we didn't deliver on time. So, but yeah, I mean, this this sucks. Yeah, and this is a genuine concern, but that's, that's where the, you know, uh, there's a gap in knowledge. There's a gap in community knowledge when it comes to production. Okay, so uh, the next part that I'm going to start is, so, so far it's all been about uh, hardware. Right, primarily. And uh, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take a seat and I'm going to walk through a lot of code for uh, connected devices. So the idea is that uh, when you're building a project using an Arduino, you're not typically thinking about things like over there updates. You're not thinking about how this is going to be in manufacturing. You're not going to think about provisioning. Provisioning is putting your SSID and Wi-Fi password into it. Right, so now, uh, this part of my uh, presentation is all going to be about the things that we can do in software. Why? Because software easily shares, right? I can easily give him a software piece which says like, you know what, this will take care of your manufacturing thing, just use it, right? And that's how it spreads way better than hardware because hardware is a lot of customization. So uh, this is actually a new project from Espressive. Again, like all things Espressive, it's completely open source. I think we have a Apache 2 or an MIT license. I, I think Apache 2. So uh, you can use it, you can port it to whatever hardware you want, uh, but we'll, I'll be talking about it in the context of ESP32 and 8266, but as you'll realize, it's not at all specific to either of those chips. So this is the thing, uh, this is the documentation URL if you want to follow along. Uh, okay, so the first thing. Yeah, so, so far the uh, presentation that I have been giving has been mostly verbal, but now it's all going to be code. Uh, so, indulge me. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it would be better if I just mirror. Yeah, I know. Uh, so, this is going to go on YouTube and I'm going to invalidate first key. Uh, but I'll again explain why it does not matter. Uh, okay. Uh, is this visible enough for everyone or should I adjust? It's okay? Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, if you go to github.com slash expressive slash ESP jumpstart, you'll find this nice repository there. Uh, the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to do a hello world. So just to ensure that, you know, we are start, uh, starting from the bare basics. Uh, before this, what I've done is I've installed a tool chain and I've installed our software development framework. So if you remember, I showed you two uh, GitHub SDKs, one for 32 and one for 86. Uh, so I'm using the 32 one right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say make it is flash. And the next thing I'm going to say is make flash monitor. So what this is going to do is I have a board connected here. Uh, it's going to erase whatever is there on its flash. And uh, I'm going to start with the hello world. 
why I want to do this is because in this presentation, what I'm going to do is incrementally add a feature and we are going to have seven such steps. In the first step, we are going to do a hello world. In the next step, we are going to do drivers for a push button and an LED. In the next step, uh, we are going to do a Wi-Fi configuration, right? Connecting to Wi-Fi. Then in the next step, we are going to scratch the third part and going to do something known as provisioning. Provisioning means you're going to use your phone to share your network credentials to the ESP32 device. So right now, okay, so this is the hello world and everything's fine. It's just your basic hello world. I'll just show you guys the code before I, that's all there is, okay? Good enough, while loop, print test. Great, so now that's your typical ritual out of the way. Now, uh, I'm going to do a make erase flash and I'm going to do make flash monitor again. So now I'm in a different folder, I'm in the drivers folder. So I've already written down some code. I'll get to the code in a bit, but it's essentially, I have a push button, I have an LED. Right now I haven't connected the LED, but it's pretty straightforward. So I have a push button on the development board that I'm using. When I press the button, it turns on a light, something like that, right? Nothing very fancy, you're typical getting started with Arduino kind of stuff. Oh yes, and uh, essentially what we're trying to build is we're trying to build a smart power outlet. You know, one of those smart switches thing, which is because it's a pretty straightforward thing, right? So what we want to do is we want to have, okay. Oh yes, uh, so. Yeah, essentially now if I press the button. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Did this happen before? Okay, I might have to skip this one because I'm not sure this is the right place for debugging this. Uh, but I'll come back to this uh, in a bit. Actually, let's just take a look at the code. Uh, if you look at the main folder here, uh, I have an app driver.c uh, and a board file for uh, board specific things. And if you look at this, uh, you'll basically have some code for a button and some code for a LED. Now let's come to the Wi Fi connection bit. So, uh, Yeah, so in this case, I'm going to put the Wi-Fi as LLI guest. Is that right? Uh, you sure? It's good? Okay, and the password is LL4086. Okay, so these are the two things that I'm going to add to this particular thing. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is, I'm just going to say, make uh, This is the awkward silent part of the presentation. Uh, but are there any doubts about what we are, uh, what I'm trying to do here? Uh, what I'm trying to do here is uh, show what are the missing pieces which are common to all applications that want to connect to the internet. So uh, be it a smart fridge, be it a light bulb, be it a 3D printer, there are some things that you will have to do regardless of what you are. So typically when you are working with Arduino, what we do is we put our Wi-Fi credentials in the code and flash that code. That's what we are doing right now. Okay, so
But when you go to production, you can't do that because you want the user to put in their own Wi-Fi credentials. That's why you need some other way because this is a headless device, right? Unlike uh, your phone, which has a display and a keyboard, you need some other method to do this. Luckily for the ESP32, we have Bluetooth on board, but for ESP8266, we do that through Wi-Fi. We could do that for through Wi-Fi in the case of ESP32 as well. How many of you have used an Echo device, Alexa device, something like that? A bunch of you. How many of you have used a smart device at all, like a light bulb? Some. Pump. Some. Sorry. Some pump. So, some pump. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So now what happened is uh, we put in those credentials in our firmware, and now uh, it connected, right? So I got an IP. It's still doing its hello world because it's in a separate thread. But this is the intermediate part, right? This is the part where like it got connected. It got its IP. Great, but this doesn't work for us when it goes to production. And right now we care only about production and not about prototype. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to go to something known as network config. Uh, so what we did was, uh, now while this happens, let me just open our GitHub. So we realized that this is a common problem, right? And what we did was we created Android and app, uh, iOS applications. And we are like, you know what? Use these uh, to build your application. Again, these applications are open source because that's the right way forward. And what you do is uh, you decide what kind of variant you want to build with this. And you say that, okay, I want to do provisioning over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. And then you just build this application. When it starts, it will start looking for devices in your vicinity which have a name with some prefix that you have seen, right? So if I'm, a com I'm from a company called, I don't know, uh, Whirlpool, uh, I want my devices to advertise themselves as under provisioning with the name WPL underscore some Unix tray, right? So I can ask my application to be like, you know what? Just show me devices from this particular thing. So uh, this is the part where I need my phones. Again, a very interesting realization uh, today was the Wi-Fi here blocks certain ports. So I want I was trying to do a secure communication with the cloud on MQTT's PLS port, and it wasn't working for quite a while before I realized that you know what maybe the Wi-Fi here is being tested here. Okay, so now. Uh, if you have BLE on your phone, you know you could scan for this device, and this will show up in your uh, list of devices. Please don't connect because that will stop me from providing a device. But essentially, uh, this is what can happen, right? And uh, again, uh, from an architecture point of view, we have taken some decisions for you. Again, all of this is in the open source, so if you want to change it, you can change it. But what we are doing is we are neglecting the transport layer security. You can use it but we are not enforcing that. Instead, we are doing public key exchange on top of that because we don't really control transports, right? Tomorrow, a new vulnerability comes down in BLE, which it did uh, apparently a few weeks ago. Uh, and then it could be that, you know, this is not secure. That's why we have certain mechanisms uh, where we exchange public keys and we use that to send the provisioning information. This is provisioning information not just for your network, but this is also for your uh, cloud connectivity or anything else. Right now, we're just going to do network uh, because I'm going to be talking about cloud in my next uh, Okay, okay. Okay, so, so this is uh, this is going to be my phone. This is my phone. I'm just mirroring the screen here. And what we do is you hit start provisioning and you see these devices near you. So think about this. So if you're a 3D printer uh, manufacturer, right? Uh, and there are quite a few of them. And you want to send this printer to someone, but you want it for them to connect it to their internet so that you know they can give 
remote cloud commands for starting and stopping the printer, if there is a new firmware available. The firmware thing is especially important because that allows you to ship faster. As long as your firmware works, you can say that, you know what boss, uh, right now not the features aren't all exactly there, but take this firmware and I'll give you a better firmware tomorrow. Okay, so uh, right now, uh, what I did is, uh, I connect, clicked on that thing, and I am going to give it my phone access point because that one, so yeah. So now what's going to happen is, I sent the credentials over Wi-Fi. So this is my SSID and password. Everyone feel free to join to my mobile hotspot. But uh, yeah, so I sent this over Bluetooth Low Energy. So this, this is an inside joke for Indians in the house because Pani Puri is one of our delicacies back home. But anyways, what happened was this was a headless device. It had no provisioning. And what I did was I scanned for Bluetooth devices near me and I gave it the SSID and Wi-Fi that I wanted to connect. Right? right? After that, it connected, it got some IP, that's it. Right? So this is one of the first things that uh, your user has to do. So it has to be a very seamless experience. And this is where most people go wrong right now. When you buy an Alexa or uh, a Google Assistant or something, the device experience is not all that great. Coming back uh, to the good stuff. Okay, so now uh, cloud connectivity. Okay, so this is a little, uh, so this is something that I actually work on at uh, my role in Espresso. So this is something that I think about a lot. But the, uh, and I come from the maker community. So I'm a computer science grad who got into electronics and all of that was DIY stuff, right? Uh, the thing is, we are at a very interesting place when it comes to hardware because we have so many amazing, uh, okay, so someone dozed off. So this is a sign of a great presentation. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, then it then it's okay. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so the thing is, we are at a point where people are doing amazing things with hardware, right? And everything's democratized. 3D printing has made cases democratized. Uh, open source software, Arduino has done great work. KiteCAD, as we were talking about, right? So everything is being democratized, except the bit about you know internet connectivity and updates and all of those things. So because what happens is then you have to download some firmware, connect it, install USB drivers, upload that firmware, you know, similar with Raspberry Pi, we have to like sudo update, update and all of those things, but it is connected to the internet. Shouldn't it be able to do it by itself? Why do I have to do that manually? And that's great because if you're a developer, uh, you're used to those kind of things in your day job, right? But if you are not, if you want to reach bigger audiences, and that's what I think uh, we at Espresso want as well, that there are so many awesome makers, and makers have made Espresso uh, what it is today to a big part, right? We became popular because of uh, makers and communists, uh, com not communists, I mean, right? makers and community members. So, uh, yeah, so that's what made uh, Espresso great, and that's one of our ways of giving it back, because we want to kind of make it very easy to connect to cloud. So what we have done, again, this is the first time that Anyone from Espresso is showing this because this literally just launched yesterday. Is if you go to espresso.github.io slash ESP jumpstart, you can download cloud credentials and start using it. Just get started, right? You don't have to sign up to AWS or Microsoft or anyone and be like, you know, I want to create credentials. Here's my credit card. The credit card bit is especially uh, something that I hate because I was a student once and that hurts, right? You don't know what's happening. You have to ask your dad for his credit card, all of those things. You don't want that. But we want people to enjoy the benefits of cloud communication. So what we are doing is we are like saying, you know what, take these credentials, do your project, and these will be valid for 14 days. Come back after 14 days, ask for something again. We'll give you again, no issue. You can use multiple email addresses. That's not an issue. We are not going to stop you from doing that. But yeah, here are some certificates. Here's how you securely connect to the internet, right? Because that's when you start opening doors like crazy. Okay, I think I've completely ignored my slides so far. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we did drivers. 
we did Wi-Fi configuration, network config, now we're doing a cloud. Okay, so, and the reason, one of the reasons I'm only showing Amazon is because, you know, we have support for that. Plus Google and Microsoft are here, so I don't want to offend anyone. So let's just stick to using who, someone who's not there. Okay, so this is uh, an important URL. Uh, if you guys, uh, what will happen is when you sign up there, you'll get an email so looking like this, where you'll be like, uh, you'll get five files. These are the device certificates uh, that you can flash on your ESP8266 or ESP32. Honestly, ESP Jumpstart is open source. If you want, you could make it work with something else as well. And that's fine with us too. We want people to be using it more and giving it back. Okay, so in this case now, again, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to say, uh, make it as flash. And I'm going to say, make flash monitor. What I've done is I've downloaded the certificates that I made myself, right? You can put in your email address, you'll get the certificates uh, yourself. And uh, I'm just going to put them in the device. Now, again, this is important because uh, this is something that happens at the manufacturing level. When your device is being manufactured, the certificates are put, it, put inside of it during that particular process, and each device has to have unique certificates, right? Because that's security 101. <laughs> I've seen devices which have been reverse engineered and hacked, which did not do that, and that's honestly terrible. But what we want to do, uh, what, one of the other motives here with this open source project is to have the best uh, security defaults as possible. If you go to production with this, uh, we want to be able to tell you confidently that, you know what, you're not missing out on any security. So I'm going to be talking about security again. Uh, but while this uploads, yeah, yeah. and uh, at the same time, uh, what we do have is we have uh, instructions on our documentation on how to make changes to this cloud from a basic command line. 10 minutes, that's it? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to fall short. Okay, anyways. Uh, uh, you did? Uh, okay. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I'm probably going to have to rush through things. Man, this is the time, this is the place which is taking up the most time. Uh, okay. So now again, uh, what I've done is uh, I've reset it to the provisioning mode, but this time I have added my certificates again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Uh, do the same thing that I did before. Okay. Where is that? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do a start provisioning. It's going to start looking for Bluetooth devices. I'm going to say, you know what? Take this. Okay. And then I'm going to say provision. Uh, now what's going to happen is the device is going to get those credentials. The next thing that it's going to try is it's going to try connecting to AWS. It's connected. So the provisioning has stopped now because you know it got all whatever it wanted correctly. And uh, what it's going to say is that the output is false right now. That means the light bulb or the smart switch is off right now. And that's it. The update has been accepted on the cloud. Now what we want to enable is for you to go to your command line and be like, you know what? Uh, oh, sorry. So to do this, even my laptop has to be connected to my iPhone because like I said, the port's been blocked. So, again, now what happened is I set the output variable to true, right? Uh, so that means that if this was a smart plug, I would have received an event saying that, you know what? Turn on the light or turn off the switch. Something like this. So I don't want people, like I personally think that if you're a student, something, someone who's you know used to Arduino and wants to get started with cloud, don't get started with all of those big, fancy, heavy clouds which have, you know, which expect you to understand resource-based access control and functions and all of those things, right? Cloud functions. Instead, this is pretty straightforward because what you had to do was you just had to do your existing device firmware, plus you had to do a simple curl call which is as simple as it gets when it comes to HTTP, right? And that's it. You turn it on, turn it off. You can write an Android application if you're a mobile developer. If you're a web developer, you could do that. And what we did was we used the same device certificates that I gave you in the mail, right? So in the cert, so this is the file, and that is the key file that we mailed to you. So those are the things that you use again. So again, this is extremely secure, 
and it's not going to be the case that you know you can access somebody else's device or something like that. This is as security conscious as possible because this is mutually authenticated TMS. Okay. Now this is the part where I wanted to spend the most time, but that's going to be difficult. Okay, so so far, uh, so a partition.csv is how your application gets divided when it goes to a microcontroller, right? When it goes on the flash, the partitions file is how it gets divided. You're familiar with this because you do that with your operating system on your laptop, right? You have your BIOS, then you have your C drive or whatever, right? Similarly, we have uh, a similar structure on ESP32. And what this means here, there are two data partitions and one app partition. The data partition is something where you know you keep uh, user-related information that you want to access, that you want to erase in the case of a reset, because let's say I'm uh, using this device and I don't want it anymore and I want to give it to him, I'm going to remove those details from that because that's my personal SSID and password. And then I'm going to do it. So then there are, uh, that's the envious part that we're talking about, the finite part is related to Wi-Fi. But when you go to production, actually, uh, what you have to do is you have to have a partition for OTA upgrades, right? So what happens is, uh, now this is the important part because the OTA upgrades, you have to solve before you go to production for the first stage, because if it's not in place, all of those devices are just running the firmware that they are uh, running by default. So this is the part that you really have to get it right during production, and that's what we are helping you here. Uh, Again, production, like what's the best way to do an OTA update is the equivalent of asking what is your favorite editor, right? Because there are so many answers and no one is wrong, luckily. Uh, but you could be sending uh, encrypted packages over MQTT TLS block by block and then I could be reassembling those on my device side. Or you could be giving me a TLS, uh, an HTTPS URL from which is pre-signed and then I have some certificates and then I use that to download that. So we are doing something like that here. Uh, okay, so I have five more minutes, great. So I'm doing something like that here, uh, wherein uh, we are assuming that you're hosting your uh, update binary on GitHub. That's why we have put GitHub server cert in the firmware, because then all you have to do is send the URL, right, uh, over MQTT or however way you prefer, and then it will download it, install it, what happens is there is an OTA 0 and OTA 1, so it keeps on switching. So by default, you'll start with OTA 0, then you'll install the new firmware in OTA 1, then you'll switch to OTA 1. The next time you're updating, you'll put the new downloaded firmware in OTA 0. Again, all of this uh, has to be uh, verified. So all the images that come are signed, and the, signed, uh, the keys that are used for signing are in the firmware by before. And I want to actually get to that, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, now this is, so I'm not going to show uh, that particular uh, demo because uh, I'm running short of time. The next thing that we have is, again, we have a similar structure here, right? Uh, but if you notice, yeah, there are two data partitions, there's one new data partition in this final app that we have. So this is called a factory data application. Now uh, think of this, so if I'm a manufacturer, I create certificates to connect to my cloud, right? And I give it to you and I'm using it, but then I give this guy this device. He doesn't need to download the certificates again because it's still a valid device, right? But he can't be using my SSID and passwords because that's data personal to me, right? So what we have here is we store the personal user data like SSID, credentials, all of those things in one NVS partition. And then we have another, which is called a factory, which, uh, can be used to keep all of those things, right? right. There is another uh, thing that we do here is those, the manufacturing partition, we kind of, uh, you can encrypt it in a different way if you want. But essentially what you do is, uh, so far, uh, okay. Yeah, so, what we do is we create a manufacturing.bin partition, which we give you a Python script to essentially, uh, you give it a CSV file, an Excel sheet, and tell uh, the Python file that, you know what, I want to keep these things in the manufacturing bin, and then you create a .bin file and then flash it to the ESP32. And that will give you the factory partition. And then what you just do is just write this. So this happens 
at the manufacturing stage. So typically the uh, production provider that you have, the factory that you are getting this manufactured from, uh, will do this for you. So you have to give him a bunch of certificates and he will sign, uh, basically he will create these binaries and transfer them. Along with some other things, for example, like the device serial number and the endpoint, the URL that which it wants to connect the cloud. So yeah, so this is the last example here, but actually that's not where all of this ends. Uh, so there are some more security considerations. Uh, for example, how do you sign the application binary? Where do you keep the keys for that? So this is where eFuses come. So this is a hardware feature, right? And what we have to do is we have to establish a root of a chain of trust, right? The eFuses are where you have kept the first set of keys then that validates your bootloader, then that goes to the application firmware, that validates that. So all of this has to be done in a stepwise sequence so that you are building a secure thing. Again, we want to make this as easy as possible for everyone. So we have uh, given some steps here. Why I can't show that is because that can end up uh, with me breaking this particular device, right? Breaking in the sense that if I lose those keys that I used to sign this particular board, I won't be able to flash on this device again which is exactly what should be happening, but for the sake of demo purposes, I'm not going to do that. But again, these are uh, instructions on how you can go forward in this. So, uh, I know I'm done, but uh, just to summarize, like we started with the hello world, we put in Wi-Fi credentials, uh, we first wrote the drivers, like for whatever logic that you're doing, it could be different for a 3D printer, for a smart fetch, or a connected bulb. So the second part is where your custom logic comes. Everything after that is more or less standard. The provisioning bit is there for all connected products. Uh, the cloud bit is going to be there for all connected products. The OTA thing is going to be there for all connected products and the manufacturing thing is going to be there for all products, not just uh, connected products. So again, this is the first time that we are showing this. So again, all of this is open source including the documentation. So if you guys have any feedback, you are more than happy to continue. And uh, one last thing, I've skipped plenty of my slides, but uh, earlier today, uh, while discussing uh, with Mitch and Bunny and everyone at the panel, we realized that there aren't enough resources for people to go to production from a hardware point of view, from a lot of point of views actually. So I think uh, Saini or Chinmay, one of them said we should do an awesome list kind of a thing. So what uh, we created earlier today was, uh, we actually created a GitHub repo. We have put in some stuff there, uh, uh, Mitch, I've sent you an email, so please feel free to contribute back to that. And uh, essentially what it does is, where is that? Yeah, so essentially it's a list of blogs, books, tools, videos, and even teardowns, uh, because uh, that's how you learn, right? You learn from picking up art, right? Don't, like, what's that Dave Jones quote? Don't, uh, don't turn it on, tear it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, a couple of us will be working on this. Uh, I've posted the link. Uh, please feel free to contribute because, uh, okay. Yeah, please feel free to contribute because, you know, uh, the, pa the point of ESP jumpstart or the point of this particular GitHub repo or the point of any of the talks that folks like Mitch and Bunny do is to spread knowledge. And this, we need more. Like we need a common space for this particular aspect of you know making and production and prototype. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I wish I had some more time, but uh, I don't want to uh, delay the next speakers. Uh, hey guys, oh that's going to be a very interesting talk. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's it from uh, my side. If you guys have any questions, I'm going to be around. I actually have another talk scheduled later, but uh, I guess. Call it. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. We have short time for questions. Which I'll be quick. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to thank Espresso for whatever you did for the community. I know, like, being a maker and having the chip for fiber, that's really amazing. It's actually and cheaper if you just get the model. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, and your support was also very really nice. I actually did one uh, project with my friend. And, uh, yeah, so. Uh, Thanks. Uh, uh, regarding my question is, uh, what would be like uh, why ESP is not yet famous in single port Kaboda? So single port Kaboda tends to have their own dedicated uh, uh, Wi-Fi DNA chip. So 
I was I was actually talking to someone earlier if I remember they were talking about doing so that the drivers, is there uh, it's not actually I think uh, the player see the thing is ESP is more suited for small light bulbs or switches because we have more application memory so you don't have to just use us as a dumb radio so that's why most people tend to use it as that uh, the Wi-Fi chipsets I mean technically that's how we started as a company right the way you, you're saying uh, ESP started like espresso started as a company doing chipsets for cheap Android tablets wherein we were just doing the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth path. And yeah, I mean, technically you can still do that, but it's just that it's become so popular for the other things that people tend to not you know, work on that so much. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. And yeah.